Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. I think Playboy's been singled out along with, uh, you know, the Miss America contest uh, and some other things as, um, you know, as the extreme example of what the, the new feminists feel is the wrong image for women. I, I'm more in sympathy than perhaps, uh, you know, the girls realize with... Women. Women. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm 35. ...than the ladies realize. I oh. use girls referring to women of all ages. You should stop. Uh, yeah. I uh, want to be called a boy. Uh, like uh, <laughs> never, I'd always felt it was, I always felt it was complimentary. The role that you have selected for women is degrading to women because you choose to see women as sex objects, not as full human beings. The day that you are willing to come out here with a cotton tail attached to your rear end. <laughs> It was just something I, you know, blocked from my mind for so long and never wanted to talk about and was kind of a painful memory for me because it wasn't what I wanted the relationship to be like. He offered me quaaludes the first night out and I, th I thought it was really bizarre. I barely knew what a quaalude was, you know, no young girl did. And he said in the 70s they used to call them thigh openers and I thought, well, this is really bizarre. And over the years I saw him offer them to girls every night we would go out. There was a nine o'clock curfew, but I soon found out you also weren't really allowed to fraternize with the staff too much or he'd get jealous. I I was asked to quit my waitressing job not long after I moved in, which it was just a waitressing job, but I feel like that was a big mistake for me because it was me kind of giving up the last of my independence. He was really the manipulator and didn't want us getting along because that served him better. Hello and welcome to the finale of Series 6, I Could Murder a Podcast. The time has come, we're at the pinnacle of the series. Ben, are you ready? I'm ready. I feel like there's going to be one person out there that said, oh, I knew it was going to be this, but absolutely not. You're, you're lying. Complete lies. You're lying to everyone. All the comments were, well, there's some good suggestions. Were there? Sure. Have you noted them down? In here. But uh, yeah, the, the, no one was close. Yeah, no one was close. You're absolutely right. I am very excited to go through this case. Um, I think it's an interesting close to the series. What has been so far, arguably, our biggest series to date. How are you doing, producer Dan? Yeah, good. Welcome back for the big finish. Congrats. <laughs> what? <laughs> just like someone's programmed you to say that. The big Welcome finish. Welcome back to the big finish. Um, I just want to say congratulations to you boys for another fantastic series. And to it, you. It is hard work presenting and reading and riffing reading and, and dealing with each hard. other's yeah shit. yeah so yeah. well well done thanks hard so much done. hard thanks. work appreciate it done hard work especially needed. when you're a full-time job needed that yeah. yeah yeah and a huge thank you to the i could murder podcast team to our editor ben bonsi to our animator phil witten to our researcher lauren mckenna parker and to chloe markey for all our help and research on over on the patreon and of course a big hand to sophie ella for helping out with all our merch and getting you guys all the merch you've ordered so thank you so much to that and also to all the lovely voiceovers we've had in all the intros. It's, it's been a great series and we look forward to next series. Yeah, well, one thing, it's taken six series to get there. One thing I've never done or we've never done is there's quite a few people that get on the episodes as soon as they come out. Audio, video. So I wanted to say to those, have a great Monday and have a great week. Enjoy yourself wherever it takes you in the world. <laughs> Just enjoy yourself. And thanks for tuning in so early. Um, I can keep going. <laughs> I know, yeah. And also, of course, a huge shout out to Gully for dressing us this series. And he, as you can see, they've, they've stepped up the game for this episode. They really yeah. have. I uh, think you can hear the outfits this yeah. week for the audio guys as well, which ben, is nice. Be loud with your outfit. Oh, what's that? What could that be, audio listeners? What could that be? And it's not a tent. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got some loud Ooh. buttons. I have to dance at that a bit. Yeah, yeah. But, um, there you go. The, I think the, the, it's quite hot in here, so the jackets probably won't be on. For, for, we, but we wanted to start off. You know, looking fresh, and we'll get a little easier for the episode. And before we, we jump into it as well, quick bit of housekeeping for the Scottish listeners and viewers. Last week, I, I mispronounced uh, Fraserburgh in the small coastal fishing town of Fraserburgh, Scotland. Um, it was me. I've had quite a few people go at me about. Oh, okay. It. I think it's. Pro oh, we both. Oh. <laughs> 
for anyone offended by our pronunciation. Uh, Get in queue, because we have a lot of people yeah. moaning about how we say <laughs> but things. But yeah, apparently it's pronounced the same way as Edinburgh. It makes sense. Fraserburgh, it? but it's spelt weird. Edinburgh's not spelt weird, is it? Anyway, <laughs> Fraserburgh. So this uh, is episode 60 of the main channel, but together Damn. with our... <laughs> But together with our um, specials as well as the Patreon episodes, that takes us up to episode 150. That is actually absolutely mad. Quite a feat, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's a load. Of, that's a centipede. Yes. <laughs> Plus 50. That was good. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. If... Mm, could have been. It could have been, yeah. Mm. You could take it. So, of course, when we are having a little break, you can head over to Patreon. Roughly $4, £4 pounds a month for an absolute back catalogue of mm. content fast pass to the cult as well as a discount on the store so everyone's a winner baby that's the truth hot chocolate yeah I'm changing I sorry <laughs> I could be in hot chocolate though I love the shirt I don't know if you could be in hot chocolate and also guys we've been inundated I think that's the word Ben inundated by cult applications and of course at the end of the show we'll be welcoming a few more people into the cult of ICMAP I've seen some people saying I thought it was a joke I'm like, where do I reply it's over on our email at hello at icmap.com but there's a lot to go through don't be offended if you haven't been, we haven't read you out on the episode because it's a lot we might have to do a cult special yeah at, well, at some point to get through there's literally been hundreds of emails which we really appreciate yeah. um, and as Tom said we don't want anyone to feel left out it's a very welcoming exclusive cult <laughs> everyone's welcome but are they <laughs> and uh, it always, always good to stand out. So maybe you know the title of your cult application, something a bit spicy in there, mm. or even this is probably going to be a guarantee to get you uh, read out. And it won't be in this series, obviously. It's going to be <laughs> next series, so a little while away. Perhaps on a rap rap party, might do some, but an audio note that would more than likely uh, get played. Yeah, and I'm thinking it might be the way forward because then we can play it on the episode and we can then dissect it, mm. even from the passion in your voice. Or a video application. Oh, now that is spicy, isn't it? That's good squishy. <laughs> anyway, enough fucking around, Ben. Mm. What is this week's case? So this week is the dark side of Playboy, the case of Hugh Hefner. We had the 11 episodes together plus the audience vote. And then a friend of mine made me aware of the Secrets of Playboy series over on Prime. So I had to create a bloody um, crime plus investigation account. Cool. It then started a bit of a rabbit hole. And the more... Bunny hole, more like. <laughs> and the more I read about this case, the more the, the deeper and darker it got. And I, yeah, I, and also the fact that there's not very much out there on mm. him and on what was going on. There is going to be obviously a lot of conjecture, um, as with a lot of these type of cases. But I think it's uh, an all round fascinating case, and one hopefully we can um, we can shed a little bit of light on and close the series on. But yes, before we start, I'm going to take this jacket off because my buttons are hitting hitting the desk all the time. So and I'm just like, even if I don't move, you can hear me. Wow! A little side note, Ben. Like, I think people like, enjoy seeing into our lives a little bit. Did my far, first car boot the other day. Did you? I had to get there bright and early, set up the store for seven. Got off. Got, was there right about 6.45 a.m. Wake up at five? I got I think five... 5.45. Mm. Those are car boot hours. It was rank. So I got there, opening the, the boot. I was, you know, you, you don't want to see anyone in the morning at that time. No. Opening the boot. The thing is, there are uh, early goers. I'm, I'm telling the story. Sorry. And yeah, so I was getting the, the table out, getting everything ready. And it's the, uh, the time in the morning when you don't want to see anyone or speak to anyone. And whilst I was opening the boot, before I even opened it, I had people with torches into the back of the car, questioning us what we had. Have you got any electronics? Have you got any shoes have you got and I was like no I was just have you got any tote bags not tote bags <laughs> good, for, good for them it was literally like zombies just like mm. all on the car and I was like come on you? and they're haggling and they're trying to trick me Ben giving me money saying I've given you that how about that for that and I was like no and but it's guy, in your hand one guy was like a second hand and I was like it's a car boot <laughs> oh Jesus I was getting a bit shirty with him but, did uh, you see any of the um, mystery parcel people because I've seen a lot of that on social media no. right? they're basically people I don't know how, how if this is legal or not but it's people that have a load of amazon packages but they've just crossed out the, the person's address black marker parcels paper bags and you pay two or three pound and you take a random oh, parcel wow. i saw a donald trump nutcracker well donald trump a nutcracker with um grabber on the on the back of it and i was like that's, cool. that's odd that was oh. cool <laughs> it was it was odd yeah enough about car boots i think just if you go into one be careful because there are relentless people there mm. some people do that for a job they mm. um upscale upcycle and sell on yeah. Interesting though, yeah. 
So this week, the series finale of series six, Hugh Hefner, The Dark Side of Playboy. There's limited stuff out there, but the other case titles that we, we saw were The Playboy Allegations, The Curse of Playboy, The Life and Crimes of Hugh Hefner, and The Endless Controversies of Hugh Hefner. Dark Side of Playboy, Playboy Allegations. Yeah, it is, it is one which, trying to do research for this, yeah, it wasn't as much out there as, as a lot of the other cases we cover. Obviously, this has been surrounded with slightly more conjecture than, and conspiracy than other cases we've covered. But a lot of the um, stories, you know, they are coming from people who were within the Playboy Mansion, who worked directly with Hugh Hefner. And a lot of people's stories kind of, yes, it's like a lot of cases, they they, they follow the same kind of patterns, similar patterns, mm-hmm. um, and they haven't spoken to each other previously before. So it's one of those things. No yeah. smoke without fire. Dry ice. Dry ice, yeah. With this kind of case, there's always going to be people that believe uh, Hefner's guilt or believe that he was innocent. It's going to always split opinion. Uh, but there's also a lot of parallels with this case, with like the Michael Jackson case, uh, the Playboy Mansion and the Neverland Ranch, you know, a place where things could happen and, you know, it's very private and kept under wraps. And also the the link with, um, you know, Michael Jackson always wanted to remain young. You know, Hugh's um, girlfriend's always remaining young. It's, it's a, a quite a parallel there. And also there's some interesting parallels between Savile and Hefner, which we're going to get into a little bit toward the end. And a little precursor, obviously, and the things we're going to be discussing are going to be allegations. So a lot of what we're going to discuss is based on opinions and hearsay, but we'll cover as much of the concrete facts and physical evidence that is available. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of allegedlies. Yes, yeah. It's an interesting case, and it's what it's, we do like to bring cases up and cover cases which maybe people haven't you know heard much about and bring some things to light. But um, yeah, this is a fascinating one. So a quote to start us off, and and please take this week's quote with somewhat of a pinch of salt. It comes from an unnamed LAPD source. After questioning Mr. Hefner, we understood that he had mountains of incriminating personal information about a powerful group of Hollywood paedophiles. We are talking about dead girls on altars, women being caged and tortured for years, Hollywood execs filming each other performing the vilest acts for blackmail, as the most evil acts are always done on the most innocent. We were building up to one of the biggest paedophile raids in history, certainly the biggest in this city in my lifetime. We were working out a plea deal with him so we could get our hands on the physical evidence and really go after the paedophiles. But then we found him dead. For people who don't know much about this case, obviously that's going to come as quite an alarming uh, quote. But as we said, it's from a LAPD source, which is quite vague within itself. But there's, there's a lot of things there which we're going to go in more depth on. We're going to talk about Hefner's life and his rise to fame and the formation and global popularity of Playboy. And we'll then get into the allegations and crimes, of which there are many, surrounding Playboy. We have a ton of conspiracies to dive into as well. A lot of people champion uh, Hefner as being very kind of progressive with his thoughts about women and their sexuality. And they, they champion him as being, you know, a positive uh, movement for people expressing themselves but other people very much say he's the opposite mm-hmm. but some people say he's both and he, he he did have elements of both things within his character mm-hmm. but behind closed doors his morals was often change so yeah it, it is a very complex and layered case but we're going to go into as much detail as possible hugh marston hefner was born on the 9th of april 1926 in chicago illinois He was the first of two boys born to Glenn Lucius Hefner and Grace Caroline Hefner, both of whom were originally from Nebraska and grew up on farms in that area. Hefner had a younger brother called Keith who was born three years after him. The pair got on extremely well and were very close all the way up until Keith's death just a year before Hughes. Just as Keith was born, the Hefner family moved into 1922 North New England Avenue in Austin, Chicago. Hefner's father, Glenn, was an accountant at the aluminium factory, and his mother, Grace, was a school teacher. Glenn and Grace had very different families, with Glenn's family being predominantly German and Grace's being mostly Swedish. The couple formed a very happy family home, but also keen to raise their boys in a strictly conservative Methodist household. So yeah, I mean, unlike a lot of our cases, it seems to be quite a happy household, but strict. Well, maybe that's not true. Most of our cases are alcoholic parents or very religious. Yeah. That tends to be the, the pattern. And there's usually a, a bit of abuse on either, yeah. either side there. But yeah, and for the time as well, this was quite normal. And what we're going to go on to talk about various rules in the household. And yeah, he had a good upbringing. No red flags so far. So despite the family home being quite a pleasant environment for Hefner, the family rules were very strict. And this mainly stemmed from his father Glenn's Puritan views. The household rules were... No swearing, no drinking, no smoking, no card games, and no radio on Sundays. Which... I mean, most of those... That's all right, isn't it? The card games, that's quite vague, isn't it? Play Snap. Let me play Snap, Glenn. 
Hefner attended Sayer Elementary School before attending Steinmetz High School. He had many friends at both schools and also achieved fairly good grades. His IQ score was actually 152, though he was said to be, have quite a laid-back approach to his studies. He was described as a very unenthusiastic academic student. He has potential, but he needs to crack on. I yeah, think, I think we've all had that in a report. Good overview, yeah. Despite the alleged unenthusiasm whilst in high school, Hefner became the president of the student council and founded a school newspaper, the Steinmetz Times. As well as this, he created a comic book called School Days, spelled with a Z, putting himself as the central character surrounded by his peers at the school. There are pictures of this which we'll, we'll put up. He's actually, he can clearly draw, and we'll put some pictures up of this. It's got kind of a Tintin style to it that's the way i kind of viewed it he was clearly a very talented cartoonist and had a passion for writing was definitely a creative from a very early age a more niche reference which I, I, i'll throw out there is they do look a bit like chris chan's sonichu which is a rabbit hole for another day it is uh yeah that's a that's a case we might one day cover so Hefner took on odd jobs around the town, including delivering newspapers and working at a local deli for the next couple of years, before joining the army during the peak of World War II. Like many of the other cases we have covered, Hefner served in a non-combative role as an army writer for a military newspaper, before eventually being discharged two years later in 1946. After the war, Hefner attended the Chicago Art Institute for a summer before attending the University of Illinois, where he majored in psychology and got a double minor in creative writing and art. He earned his degree in two and a half years before taking a graduate course in sociology at Northwestern University before dropping out. During his time studying sociology, he focused on Alfred Kinsey's Sex Research Institute. So it's very interesting that Hefner chose to study some of Kinsey's works. Alfred Kinsey actually came up with the Kinsey scale, which is also called the heterosexual homosexual rating scale. And it's basically used in research to describe a person's sexual orientation based on one's experience or response at a given time. Essentially, Alfred Kinsey was suggesting no one is purely heterosexual, no one is purely homosexual, they fall somewhere on this particular scale, which again will we'll crop up later in, uh, as we go on to talk more about Hefner's beliefs. A big moment in Hefner's life happens next, and some have claimed that this would mark the inspiration for his motivations to go on and start Playboy. Hefner for many years had been infatuated with a local girl who played the drums for various bands across Chicago. Her name was Betty Conklin, and according to Hefner, she was a perky brunette. Hefner, who had been fairly shy and reserved when it came to having females in his life to this point, finally plucked up the courage to ask Betty to go on a hayride with him. However, all was not plain sailing. Betty turned him down and ended up going on the hayride with his best friend instead. And this absolutely crushed Hefner. Hefner would go on to say in a later interview, she picked someone else to go on a hayride instead of me, so I reinvented myself. I began referring to myself as Hef instead of Hugh. So later that year, Hefner married his first wife, Mildred Millie Williams, with whom he would go on to have a son and a daughter, and landed the role of copywriter at the Chicago office of Esquire magazine. He is very good at this role, and there are many images of his work and articles here. Another hammer blow hit Hefner when Millie admitted, shortly before the pair's wedding, that she had cheated on him whilst he was away in the army. Hefner called this the most devastating moment of my life. Out of guilt from this, Millie would allow Hefner to sleep with other women whilst they are married. So just two years into the role at Esquire, when the office began to transition from Chicago to New York, Hefner demanded and was rejected a $5 raise, so he quit. On that note, the same office of the magazine rejected Charles Beaumont, The Crooked Man, which would later be published in Playboy. Yeah, so to this point, and obviously I knew nothing about Hugh Hefner apart from I'd seen him in The Simpsons. That was when I first, when I was a kid, I saw him in The Simpsons, asked my dad, who's that? And my dad just sort of stayed quiet. But I didn't know anything about his life, how Playboy was formed, which we'll, we'll go on to talk about. But to this point, he's in his early 20s. His high school sweetheart's gone to a hay, gone on a hayride uh, with his best friend. His wife has cheated on him whilst he's away in the army. Mm -hmm. And now he's landed somewhat of a dream role, but then been rejected a pay rise. So a lot of rejection to this point. Yeah, but I mean, I get the... Um wife cheating on you but the other two is just like that's just normal it happens to everyone doesn't it? exactly so i don't see like for what would go on to happen yeah well there's, i'm looking for red flags and all i'm seeing is there's different red flags and and uh, a rose tinted flag kind of explain explain that to me well just I'm, I'm sort of if you if you don't quite like a red wine some people drink rosé don't they so like a rosé sort of tinted flag so it's not quite a red, but it's not no, quite, not um, quite a white. So yeah, but I think like, what I'm trying to say is those things aren't enough, I would have thought, to make someone allegedly act the way they're going to, to act. Oh, definitely not. And I think he'll obtain a lot of power and fame that will influence that. But I was trying to look for what could maybe warp his view slightly. And Again, if you ask for a job, if you pay rise, and someone's like, no, you don't go, oh. <laughs> 
the whole world's against me. <laughs> And a yeah. girl that's not interested in you. Yeah, but the, we are clutching at straws in terms of what I'm could motivate not. I I am clutching <laughs> at straws here in terms of what could motivate him. And these are the three things I've got. Not given a pay rise to quit, rejected for the hay ride, and then the wife cheating. The wife cheating on him, obviously yeah. the most significant uh, moment there. But other than that, normal childhood, normal adolescence, couple of issues. Slight issues. One issue, yeah. One, one slight issue, yeah. No, that's an issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Hefner then moved into an apartment at 6052 South Harper Avenue in Woodlawn, Chicago, with his wife, Millie. This is where, at the age of 27, he would go on to write the very first edition of Playboy. And a quote from Hefner of the time, I was raised in a very typically Protestant Puritan home with a lot of repression. And I think that starting the magazine and the content of the magazine are a reflection of that. And I think that the changes that we have played some part in the changing of society have also taken place inside of me. He would later go on to claim that he, and in turn Playboy, were the face of American sexual liberation. I would like to be remembered as somebody who played some positive part in changing the social sexual values of my time. Which I think a lot of people, even with these allegations that's come out, would say that he still did and still had a hand in. Yeah, um, definitely. It's not as easy to say, oh, he was lying the whole time, he didn't believe in these things. Yeah, I mean, he, there are there are still, even his biggest cricket... Cricket? <laughs> Even his. So you say, when you say a joke. Yeah. Even his biggest critics have have still praised the work that he did, and I some of this work that he did in the formation of Playboy. I had absolutely no idea about the the cultural significance of it all. So we will go on to talk about that now. So the formation of Playboy and later Playmate promotions, Hefner was jobless and in a financially poor position. He then came up with an idea of a magazine targeting men that would combine unconventional news stories and interviews of the time with images of beautiful women scantily clad. Hefner initially wanted to call this publication Stag Party, but due to copyright infringement from Stag Magazine, he didn't pursue the name. A former colleague, Eldon Sellers, suggested the name Playboy of the defunct Detroit sports car company, and Hefner loved it. Hefner wrote the very first edition, but did not number or date the edition as he was unsure as to whether or not there would be a second edition. So America in 1950s were trying to distance itself from almost 30 years of war and extensive periods of economic depression. For many, the magazine proved to be a welcome antidote to the sexual repression of the era. Yeah, and with the, he recalls that calling it Playboy was one of the masterstrokes of his, of his life. He said that it, the vision he had at the time was literally, if you imagine the Playboy bunnies and, and everything like that, he, he had the exact same vision, but antlers. Oh. Yeah. It's just because we think of it now as that. Yeah. Playboy, though, as a name as well. Do you think Jägermeister would have gone with bunnies if... if Smart. Smart. I don't know it? if it was around. Probably was. No, but afterwards, because if yeah. that was such a... You linked that with that, yeah, then you yeah. say so you wouldn't go with if a stag party. Stag party sound, sounds... See, on the surface of it, stag party would feel like a cheesier name and probably a bit more tacky. Yeah. Well, but then, then when you think about what Playboy means, it's like... Mm. Yeah. The way the car company were using it as was in... They were uh, sports cars. Yeah. And there's like the way that their branding worked was as almost like a luxurious toy. Mm. And that's almost the same approach that Hefner has, which is disgusting. But yeah. But also just means wank. <laughs> it's encouraging you to, you to play boy and read this yeah. magazine. And he, and he has got a, this. A play man. Just, it, well, exactly. I, he's got this fascination with youth as well. Mm. So obviously the idea of play man would would, uh, would never have floated with him. But so play like the boy. Worst, the worst superhero ever just doesn't get anything done. Play man. Play man. What's he doing? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it bricks in front of oh, I thought it was a skipping rope. Oh. Yeah. But he's intrigued. Yeah, so he's got the idea, he's got the name, and he starts writing the first edition. Now, in order to fund this venture, Hefner ended up taking out a mortgage loan of almost $1,000, though some sources say that he sold all of his furniture in order to raise this. And he also went on to borrow $2,000 from a combination of his mother and his brother. His mother did not believe in or support the idea itself, but she gave Hugh the money because she believed in her son. This money, together with another $5,000, which was raised between 45 separate investors, enabled Hefner to print and publish the very first edition of Playboy in December of 1953. 
The first edition is a very striking front cover. It's got Marilyn Monroe on it. And perhaps due to the fact that it had Marilyn on the on the roll and also promised to contain a nude photo of her in the centerfold, which it did, it hit the streets and very quickly sold over 50,000 copies. We'll go on to talk more about Hefner's fascination with Marilyn Monroe later, but essentially he used a large portion of that money to buy the rights to a colour photograph of Monroe in the nude that was a huge factor in the success and the popularity of the magazine. And it was actually whilst she was at the height of her popularity as well, but she had posed for a calendar shoot under a pseudonym four years prior to that. So it was an old photo, but he used it to his advantage. Hefner also published Charles Beaumont, The Crooked Man. The science fiction story explored the idea of straight men being persecuted in a world where homosexuality was the norm. The magazine received angry letters as a result, so Hefner responded, If it was wrong to persecute heterosexuals in a homosexual society, then the reverse was wrong too. Hefner was advocating for gay rights from 1955, long before many others were. So the Playboy logo, which uh, would go on to become, you know, a huge, hugely popular, you know, people have tattoos of it, people have it on random bits of merchandise. It's, it's in a lot of... Lockdown was obviously quite long. Uh, social isolation was quite long, but it's in a lot of those Guess the Brand uh, oh, that's competitions. Not I was expecting you to go with that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So the Playboy logo would draw criticism and conspiracy to a lone white rabbit wearing a bow tie. A Hefner claimed to have chosen the rabbit for its humorous sexual connotation and because the image was frisky and playful. Uh, conspirators claim a lone white rabbit represents going down a rabbit hole following the white rabbit means following an unlikely clue and finding yourself in the middle of an extraordinary situation the situation often challenges your beliefs and changes your life the white rabbit is so curious so strange that alice cannot help but to follow him i guess you i mean you can make anything into an oddity can't you really Mm. but the a, a young blonde girl following the rabbit down the hole you could link quite easily to, to Hefner and what he go on to kind of become it is not an animal it is the idea of linking the girls to animals in itself exactly yeah you know dehumanizing them it's an interesting one so the magazine became a hit and Hefner would very quickly begin to build his sexually liberating empire playboy editions would continue to hit the shelves and money as well as heavy criticism would continue to hit Hefner Soon, Playboy Enterprises was launched, the publishing group which operates the magazines. Playboy's Playhouse would become a regular fixture on television between 1959 and 1960, as well as Playboy After Dark. I'm assuming that that is um, Blue Movies. I could be very wrong, actually, because at the time, nothing like that was... As well as Playboy After Dark. (laughs) Lick your lips and look at me when you say it. Sorry. Hefner himself became a focal fixture and television personality, much like how he had often fantasised. So if you go back to um, the School Days magazines that he was drawing or the cartoons Mm. he was building up, he always put himself as the main character and everyone else was revolving around him. They also launched a series of Playboy clubs and resorts all over America. Playmate productions and Playmate promotions were also launched and Playboy rapidly became much more than a magazine. For Hefner, it was a lifestyle. They also had various talent agencies and modeling agencies pop up all over across Mm. America that fell under these organizations. And young girls and young women across America would all quickly, it was kind of like, it was framed as an opportunity to change your life, to be yourself and to to be fully sexually liberated, which made it a very attractive proposition to young people all across America. And Hefner became very much like the idol of many young men across America. So Playboy initially used their popularity to write articles about things that newspapers and magazines were not, said to have been instrumental in the advancement of the First Amendments, raising and discussion issues that other publications wouldn't touch, civil rights, abortion, racial segregation, police corruption and capital punishment. Which, to be fair, like, I mean, I can't say I've ever read a Playboy magazine, let alone an an old one. Hey, let's change that. Um, Annoyed I didn't get it on the business card because this is technically research. (laughs) Is it? Yeah. You research a lot, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, You're always researching. You were were researching way before we were covering this case. Yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't actually opened it yet. I wanted to do it together. It's a secret package, but... No, this is just what it arrived in. But I am annoyed I could have put this on the business account. I didn't think about that. But then it would have been obvious when I surprised you. That's also why I asked you why you didn't have your glasses. Because you put your... For people listening, uh, Ben's brought his glasses. Yeah. Wow. Are they, they're just pe- pe- they're petrol station glasses, aren't they? These are my mum's, yeah. yeah. So we've got... Um, I don't know what issue this is. This is January of 1998. I can't actually see anything. I always thought that they were literally just cover to cover 
images. I didn't realize they were actually articles and、mm. and things like that.、It's, when we were growing up, we had Nuts and Zoo Max Power. magazine. Max Power, yeah. Shout out to Josh, big fan of Nuts magazine. Oh, there you go, Josh.、Um, but a little lad mags. I mean, this is thick. First、yeah. of all, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's got an interview with Billy Bob Thornton, which actually I'm quite keen on、hey? getting involved in. Please do. How smart are you about Seinfeld? Seinfeld.、Yeah. Seinfeld, not very smart. Yeah, apparently, um, um, Shannon Tweed is our cover girl for this month. Cool. Do you want to just open it random page? Yeah, see what、oh, you let's、get? open it. Okay, that was accidental.、Um, well, you you bent you've, you've bent over a corner of the, the page beforehand. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it is full full nodes. Oh, it, what's that then? Oh, sorry, it goes both ways. Just like <laughs> yeah. Oh, it goes more. Look, <laughs> you. I think that's my centerfold, isn't it? Our. Centerfold. I mean, this obviously hasn't been shown on the.、Um, well, we can pick later. Just、uh, there and there and there. Oh, it's. Oh, <laughs> I didn't think it would be everything. Okay. Well, have you seen a naked woman before, Ben? Oh, look, that's cool. Little cartoon. Yeah, little cartoon. Could have been、uh, Hef. Well, whilst we let Ben、oh, go, let Ben go through the magazine.、Uh, we're going to do a quick shout out to our friends over at Dead Happy. It's like the Twits. What do you mean? It's like the twist. It's like the Quentin Blake sort of style. It's not at all like that. Kind of. It's more like the Guardian. So we want to say a big, big thank you to our friends over at Dead Happy for sponsoring this week's episode. Like we mentioned before,、um, we're in the middle right now of a cost of living crisis, but that doesn't mean that there has to be a cost of dying crisis. And one thing that I think is very relevant is people probably don't know just how affordable life insurance can be. They don't, do they? No, they really don't.、And、I always that, think that. it's a bugbear of mine, actually. <laughs> Oh, scary! And Tom, sometimes when I read about signing up to various policies or whatever, you're you always know, reading them. Reading about so many things. We put in the Playboy magazine for two minutes. Life insurance policies. <laughs> you're gonna wake yourself to death. <laughs> you can get that all in. You tried. <laughs> get paper cut. <laughs> When I think about insurance policies, Tom, I'm thinking, how much is this going to cost me? And the truth Arm is, I'm in a leg. Probably you're thinking. You're you? thinking usually yes, but the, the truth is, with the guys at Dead Happy, it costs you less than a Costa coffee, or less than half of what it cost me to get this Playboy magazine off of eBay. Yeah, yeah, which was I've paid over the odds for it. I'm aware. You Playboy, but you don't play around with life insurance, Ben. What they like about you? You don't mess around when it comes to the the hard facts.、Mm-hmm. All jokes aside, we are in the middle of a cost of living crisis. People are struggling out there. Dead Happy actually cover more than most other providers in terms of various mental health conditions because they've redesigned the process. Which is another reason why we're so happy to be、um, sponsored by Dead Happy. We really believe in what they're doing, and we think it's great that they're, you know, so accessible for lots of different people. So why not head over to DeadHappy.com and use our code Murder for three months free, and it'll be helping you guys out, but also be helping us out and look after yourself. Stay safe. And back to the episode. As Tom said,、uh, Hefner in the Early formation of Playboy, they were very much changing the game, and Hefner very much wanted to push agendas and topics that that were very rarely touched by other publications that would predominantly cater towards a white audience. Playboy would go ahead and actually、uh, interview and write articles about Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King, as well as Jesse Jackson. And as well as this, not only the magazine, but when Playboy's Playhouse started airing on television in 1959, it was considered very Very progressive、uh, for the time, so there were very strong Gen Pro laws that meant white people were not allowed to mingle with black people on television. However, Hefner very much pushed for equality and an air of acceptance, which drew him for the time a lot of criticism. I didn't know about any of this、no. uh, regarding Playboy's history or even Hefner's. He would often invite and interview many black guests and performers to the show and ensure that they were treated as equals. Following this, the first line of Playboy clubs opened up in 1960s. So during the day, it would be sort of like a bar and grill, and then during the night, it would turn into a bar and thrill. Absolutely, spot on. But this was at the time of heavy racial segregation. The clubs were、uh, accepting、uh, to people of all races, and actually employed people of all races as well. So they had black general managers, black Playboy bunnies, and implored for the union of all races and cultures. Which again, there were lots of white-only clubs, white-only bars. So at the time, again, he's really pushing for equality for all. So, in a series of 25 articles presented consecutively in Playboy magazines during the 1960s, Hefner wrote about and promoted what became known as the Playboy philosophy. 
This was essentially an evolving manifesto on politics and lifestyle. It frequently referenced Hefner's philosophy about the nature of man and woman, claiming that people needed to be more aware of the truths of human sexuality. However, Hefner never lost sight of the fact that it was pictures of nude women, which ultimately sold the magazine. So yeah, basically these consecutive articles, they read... A lot of people see say that it reads kind of like a cult manifesto. Mm. His beliefs were sort of along the lines of, I can do anything as long as I don't hurt someone. So I can be with this person as long as I don't hurt someone. Yeah. I can... It was basically living a life without consequence if yeah. you're still a good person at heart. Yeah, which people would argue that he was might have been thinking he wasn't hurt people, but him and his close friends and close allies were seeming to be not having to abide by the same rules as a lot of other people. Actually, not another name for the for the episode could have been the Playboy Cult. So by the late 1950s, Playboy's circulation had surpassed that of Rival Magazine and Hefner's former employee, Esquire, with Playboy magazine sales and subscriptions reaching a million copies a month. Wow, I bet he loved that as well. Mm. All could have been avoided if he got that $5 raise. It's like that bakery used to work. If you left there, you're like, oh, lads, see you later. Yeah. And your buns are out selling them next week. Oof. Oh. Yeah. Benny's buns. Benny's buns. Yeah. Tasty. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> really tasty. Yeah. Mm. What are you putting inside them? Everything. Everything. Nice. Big buns. Yeah. Big Benny cakes. Heckles. Do you say heckles cakes? I don't like heckles cakes. <laughs> Spoiled oh. dick. Not of bakery, is it? Pudding. Pudding. Yeah. So by this point, obviously the magazine is a huge success. The company is growing and growing and growing. Work on Playboy completely consumed Hefner and his rise to fame left him with very little time for his wife and children. His marriage began to suffer as a result and in 1959, Hefner and his first wife divorced. During the 1960s, as Playboy took to television stations, Hefner became the living and breathing persona of Playboy. And this is where you see him dressed in a sophisticated silk smoking jacket with a pipe in hand. Hefner promoted a bon vivant lifestyle in his magazine and in the television shows that he hosted. So he would interview different performers, singers, artists, personalities. He would very much play to that boy. Playboy. That sounds No, sorry, it does sound inappropriate, inappropriate doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. But he would very much play almost like a caricature. Let me try something. Yeah. He would very much play for that boy. Do you think that? That works. Let me try something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> he very much would let the boy play. Wow. He, that kind of sounds less <laughs> horrific. One more time. Okay. <clears throat> really get into it. He would very much live the boy's dream of playing with the boy. And let him be. Let the boy play. Let the boy eat his cake. <laughs> he had his cake. And played with it too. <laughs> yeah. That works. So Hefner maintained this persona as he began to socialise with the famous and wealthy, always in the company of many young, beautiful women. As the magazine and television shows increased success gave rise to the attention of the national mainstream, Hefner was more than happy to portray himself as the charismatic icon and spokesperson for what he considered to have ignited the sexual revolution of the 1960s. So after generating a fortune and dominating mainstream media over a relatively short period of time, Hefner makes the decision to purchase a 29-room gothic Tudor-style mansion in the early 1970s for $1 million. 29 rooms. Mm, it's a lot of rooms. It is. The home was named the Playboy Mansion and it became hugely symbolic and synonymous for the Playboy brand. It's a room for every day of the month, in some months. Yeah, definitely, Ben. Yeah. It's crazy. I guess if you count the grotto which had in the garden. Yeah. It covers even more. You're right. Hefner would allow many of his Playboy bunnies or playmates to reside in the mansion with him and he would have up to eight serious girlfriends at a time. Um, yeah, Hef this is where it starts <clears throat> to get a bit... Mm. Get a bit what? Just a bit... Mm. Hefner began to throw frequent lavish parties and put on events at the mansion, which attracted many A and B list celebrities. A Disneyland for adults, some would say, Ben. Some would, yeah, some have said that, actually. Yeah, yeah. quite a few people. That's what you wrote in the notes. Thank you. A projection. So Hefner would describe the Playboy Mansion as a Disneyland for adults, a projection of a way of life, adolescent dreams and fantasies that are never to be lost. Once they pass that gate, nobody grows older in the Playboy Mansion, mm. which is, a, is... Once they pass that gate, it's mm. very hard for them to get out. Mm. So alone grow older. But also just the, the talking of age, not people growing older, and also yeah. living out their fantasies. When you hear about kind of some of the uh, allegations, it's it's very um, yes. So as Tom mentioned, he had up to eight serious girlfriends at any one time. And when he was questioned about this and why, can, you know, consider remarrying or having a one serious relationship in his life, he said, "Because of these." Hmm? 
He said, I want to attract the young ladies that are going to run with me in my life. I'm not going to run with them in their life. I'm not sure what age he was when he said that. Not a lot of running, I wouldn't have thought. No, doesn't look the... No. Or is it a pipe on the go? Yeah. But as Tom mentioned, yeah, he had up to eight girlfriends at any one time, but he was always... Why this is important. He consistently had between five and eight girlfriends at any one time. What's the perfect amount of girlfriends to have, Ben? Just just one would be... Would be good. Zero to one? <laughs> Uh, somewhere in between. That's all right, yeah. 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 0.5. <laughs> yeah. yeah, five or eight. Oh, it's a lot, isn't it? It is. Busy. I've forgotten another birthday. Oh. Oh. What was the... Oh. That's what you did. What was it? Dan. Good luck. So the mansion was complete with a pool, a zoo, and a grotto. So the grotto was in the pool, wasn't it? It's kind of like a little caved area in the pool, yeah. which um, I imagine got very grotty with the kind of things that's going on there. And the surrounding land was walled off from the general public. Hefner employed a large security team, many of whom were either current or former LAPD officers. And he fitted the mansion with surveillance in every single room. Even his staff would wear cameras on their blazers. Young women from all over the country saw what appeared to be the perfect lifestyle in a pristine palace, when in reality it was far from what met the eye. And as well, for the for the time, the surveillance technology in the mm. house was next level. Mm. Like he had a security room where the whole wall of televisions. And he claimed that it was for security purposes, but also they were constantly making art with the films that they were recording, which is just... Mm, don't like it. Why are you doing a little dance when you're saying it? I was just... It was nervous. Ner so you're, mm, mm, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd hate it. We're looking very birdcage today, aren't we? What's birdcage? Robin Williams film. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about that before. But today feels it. So on the note of the Playboy Mansion looking like a palace from the outside, but very, very different on the inside, there are many people that have said the inside was left in an absolute state. So Hefner kept many dogs, and as such, there was dog feces often found all around the property. All of the bedrooms had second-hand mattresses and bed linen. Very strict curfew and routine was imposed on anybody who lived in the property, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, with the exception of Hefner. He had his own butler, his own chef, his own resident doctor, his own security team, and he invited his best friends to come and stay at the property. There were also, which is less frequently mentioned, several smaller Playboy base mansions purchased around the areas. And he would basically, again, get his friends and family to, to live in other mm. play, mini Playboy mansions. Just in Playboy Canada. houses. Playboy house, yeah, playhouse. With this, obviously, the outward projection of Playboy Mansion is a very exciting, one-of-a-kind place to live and, and live out all of your dreams. So from the outside, young girls, young women all over the country are seeing this, seeing all these beautiful models living their life and, and seemingly being their happiest. It's at this point that various Playboy modelling agencies would start to be inundated with applicants that wanted to either visit the mansion, live in the mansion, work for Playboy altogether. And this is how some have speculated that they then start grooming and luring girls to the mansion, procuring models to then potentially traffic as sex workers. So as well as being quirky in appearance, Hefner had a strange diet, and according to his butler, Stefan Tettenbaum... That is a butler's name, isn't it? Stefan. Tettenbaum! He fetch drank, me a... I'll let you know. He drank, Fanta. Fetch me a Fanta. Orange. <laughs> With yeah. ice. I'm done now. Don't spill it, Tettenbaum. So he drank around 30 to 40 Pepsis a day. I had to wrap each of them in a special red napkin, according to the instructions. He ate mostly M&Ms, two or three pounds a day, and red licorice. Hef wasn't a romantic. He was a king, the emperor. You were either in the magazine or the bedroom, or you went home. So yeah, it's very bizarre and very unhealthy. A lot of people who are successful have really dog shit diets. Like um, Vince McMahon's got a terrible diet. Donald Trump. I think he drinks like some mad amount of Diet Cokes a day, like yeah. 15 cans, 20 cans of Diet Coke. Very bizarre. Stefan also claimed that he managed a sexual schedule for Hefner. When I was his valet, I was required to keep his schedule of sexual events in his bedroom. What girl he would be having sex with and what costume she, she would be wearing. He would also hire porn stars, male and female, to come to the mansion and have sex with them in front of him. So Hefner had a special headboard in his bed that was required to be stocked with 150 condoms at any given time to contain mason jars full of Viagra and cocaine, boxes of quaaludes and a bucket 
of sex toys. Never heard it described as a bucket of, mm. um, including dildos, handcuffs, whips, chains, bonds, and blindfolds. This was deep cleaned and sanitized by staff on a daily basis. Imagine that. What did you get up to today, son? Well, it's funny you ask. Deep cleaned load of dildos. So regarding Hefner's special headboard, uh, this has been confirmed by uh, his his valet, his butler, and various staff of the Playboy Mansion. But yeah, deep cleaned and sanitised on a daily basis. Mm. Ooh, a bucket full of dildos. Yeah. Another insight from Stefan. Thursday nights were referred to as pig nights at the Playboy Mansion. Hefner's friends would go out and pick up about a dozen sex workers from a nearby red light district. They were then sat around a large dinner table at the dining room and told they could order anything they wanted from the kitchen. One by one, they were then taken into another room and inspected by Hefner's doctor. The girls that passed the doctor's inspection would then go on to have sex with Hefner's friends while Hefner watched. Piglet. Dinner for schmucks gives me those those vibes, but obviously with a lot more going on. Dinner for schmucks, I don't think they fucked them. In front no, of them. That's, that's a lot more going oh, on. Okay, sure. Yeah, sort of stuff. They just have dinner, don't they? So do they purposely find unattractive sex workers? This is the thing. Some of them were said to have been attractive. Some of them were allowed to return to the mansion, but others were intentionally unattractive. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Not very nice. On one such night, according to Hefner's ex-girlfriend, Sondra Maston, Hefner allegedly once forced a heavily intoxicated porn star, Linda Lovelace, to perform oral sex on a German shepherd whilst he and his friends watched, which is just... Beyond just horrific. to specify, you mean a dog? Yes, I do mean a dog, yeah. <laughs> Not just um, a German shepherd. I would have preferred it if it was a, a, a literal shepherd that was German. Mm. But um, no. So after the last week's chat about the um, scruffy woodsman, yes. he, he had to go to specify these things. Absolutely. Yeah, so we're talking about a dog. Yes, yeah, so Linda's then husband was also involved trying to make it happen. Yes. Which again is bizarre. It's, this is horrible. A quote uh, from Sondra, you want to talk about depravity, this is despicable. Apparently, afterwards, when questioned about why they did this, Hefner said, dogs have needs too. So this is where things, in terms of the allegations and in terms of what witnesses have claimed happened, start to get very, very dark very, very quickly. So obviously lots of different people wanted to live in the Playboy Mansion. The life of a Playboy bunny or a playmate wishing to live at the mansion was definitely not as, as glamorous as what it was made to seem. So a bunny would work at the various clubs or resorts and a playmate would be in the magazines or the video. They then also had Playmate of the Month and Playmate of the Year. First time I heard that term was the Zebrahead song. First time I've ever heard Milky Clear used as a, as a lyric. Mm. I'm going to make that Milky Clear for my Playmate of the Year. Yeah. The Playmates would get $1,000 per week pocket money in cash from Hefner. But in order to get this money, they all had to queue up in his bedroom and help clean up the dog feces in order to receive How the money. How much dog shit was there? It's like Dan's Garden. <laughs> Fuck off. Whoa! They were then Ben's allowed... old house. Uh, no, it was more mostly piss. No, it was a lot of shit. Anyway. They were allowed to live at the property rent-free and were given their own room. They were allowed to decorate the room however they liked. They were given opportunities to achieve fame and celebrity for the magazine, but these did not come without a cost. And most of the magazine's shoots would pay poorly, often paying the models over a two or three year period. Wow. Which again, I think for the money they were making is bizarre. Mm. Um, but then is that re is that re retaining them so that they stick around for the money? Is that built into their I guess, contract? I guess it is, isn't it? If you get a thing up the payday, maybe they could just kind of hit the road. But if they're like, I'm owed this money, it's going to make you stick around, isn't it? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And in terms of the clubs and resorts, they basically had a, a, an employee structure that's, that's quite, quite interesting. And maybe this is to, again, reinforce their culture. So they had a bunny, which was kind of typical sort of waitress level role. They then had assistant bunny mothers and bunny mothers. So the bunny mothers would oversee 40 to 80 bunnies and they were there to essentially manage them but also ensure their well-being and safety and damage control from a media perspective. So most of the bunny mum, most bunny mama. You said you foresee a bunny, bunny mama. mama. So most of the bunny mummers. Most of the bunny mothers were usually former bunnies that had worked their way up and it was kind of used as a tool to say, look, in a few years time, you could be a bunny mother. So that was kind of the limited pros of being able to live in the mansion. Tom is now going to talk us through the cons. 
well, 115 is bed. So yeah, this is a list of all the kind of strict rules you had to abide by in order to be part of this. A lot, lot stricter than his strict upbringing, mm. house rules. You must do anything Hefner asked of. Strictly daily curfew of 9pm. Isolated from the rest of the world, not allowed to keep secondary jobs. Not able to have external relationships, no boyfriends or husbands. Thursday night is a club night, you have to go out with Hefner. Followed by either one-on-one -on -one sex or group orgy with Hefner afterwards. Why Thursday night? Because Tuesday though. night was pig night. Oh, there's only two days in the week. That's fair. Yeah. The only um, Tuesday, Thursday kind of guy, isn't he? Well, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Not allowed to leave the property unless it's exceptional circumstances, which has to be authorised by Hefner. Only allowed to have friends or family visit if Hefner approved. All playmates wear matching pyjamas to say goodnight to Hefner each night. Playmates are routinely checked by the in-house doctor for STDs, as well as to ensure they are the correct weight. A strict diets impose on those that become overweight. That is horrific. Playmates were encouraged to take drugs to manage weight loss and also encouraged to take thigh spreaders, which were quaaludes on nights out. Yeah, to kind of ease them into the night, which is absolutely horrific. Playmates must service A-list guests and visitors to the mansion. Service. I'm sure we'll get into some of the um, A-list guests and visitors he had to the mansion, but um, one of the notable people is Bill Cosby. Uh, and that kind of gives you an undertone of exactly what the things were going on. Yeah, very, very close friends, a regular visitor. Cosby still. Yeah, often found in the grotto. Uh, Co Cosby in the grotto just sounds awful. Worst game of Cluedo ever. <laughs> ever. He was there a lot. Outstayed his welcome, in my opinion. And around this time as well, Hefner developed another obsession, not with uh, Marilyn Monroe, this time with Charles Manson. He was kind of captivated by the idea of his followers adoring him so much. And he saw news reports, obviously, of the Manson family women following him into court and outside mm. sort of supporting him. And there are a lot of comparisons that have been drawn ever since, which, again, did not expect to learn that about The cult Hefner. of Playboy. The cult of Playboy. So at this point, and for many decades onwards, Hefner has the world at his feet. He is very much in his own world. He is surrounded by beautiful women who are wanting to build careers and a life for themselves. Hefner is untouchable. He can seemingly want, demand, or do anything that he pleases without fear of reprimand. And it is here that we move into our timeline. So we're going to go a little bit back into the timeline a little bit earlier on and then kind of build into the, all the allegations that would come up against Playboy and Hugh Hefner. December 1953. Playboy was put on the map and propelled into the spotlight with his iconic first issue featuring Marilyn Monroe on the cover. However, the new pictures of the famous blonde which were included within the magazine's centerfold were actually used against Marilyn's consent. Prior to Playboy being a household name and before her superstardom, Marilyn Monroe was a struggling actress by the name of Norma Jean Baker. She agreed to be snapped by photographer Tom Kelly out of sheer desperation and made a mere $50 out of the naked shoot. She pleaded with Tom Kelly to never tell anyone about the private shoot as she was so embarrassed and feared the images would come back to haunt her. Years later in 1953, they had been splashed across Playboy magazine and Marilyn was on show for the whole world to see. Them launching it and trying to do it in that way and obviously just not taking any note or care about Marilyn's like, feelings about it, it immediately starts off with uh, uncomfortable footing. Definitely, definitely. I also thought as well when, when doing the research for this, I had in the back of my mind his birth name would have been completely different to Hugh Hefner. I don't know why, but there you go, Hugh Marston Hefner. Hugh Hefner had bought the photos from a calendar company for $500 and decided to use them for his own personal gain without ever consulting the woman depicted in them. The first issue went on to sell over 50,000 copies and Playboy exploded onto the scene, becoming an overnight success story. Marilyn Monroe was projected to stardom in her own right and went on to become one of the most famous women in the world and still remains of iconic status to this day, 60 years after her death. However, she never saw an extra dime from the release and use of her pictures. From the beginning, Hef demonstrated that he viewed women as objects that could easily be bought and that he could exercise his power to take advantage of them for his own personal gain. Marilyn and Hef never actually met, but it is alleged that Hefner was obsessed with the Hollywood starlet, saying, I'm a sucker for blondes, and she is the ultimate blonde. He even went on to purchase the burial plot next to hers in 1992 for the sum of $75,000, stating, and this is hideous. As fuck, yeah. Stating, I will be spending the rest of my eternity with Marilyn, and once again, not giving a second thought to the last wishes of his object of desire. Even in death, he clearly felt powerful enough to take that decision away from a woman with no voice. 
In January 1958, Playboy was hit with a further scandal when 16-year-old schoolgirl Elizabeth Ann Roberts was used for a Playboy centerfold. The shoot featuring the minor was suggestively titled Schoolmate, Playmate. It is reported that although Elizabeth turned up to the initial casting with her mother, two of them lied about her real age, stating that she was an adult. When it was discovered that Elizabeth was in fact underage, both Playboy and Elizabeth's mother was charged with the delinquency of a minor. However, the charges against Hef were ultimately dropped when it was established that he would not have been privy to knowing the girl's age, real or not. But in a shocking twist, Elizabeth herself was sent to jail for 15 days for refusing to cooperate with a judge who was questioning her. I mean, it is. Yeah. There's a magazine's responsibility to know. You at least ask for documents. Yeah. It can be suspected that her silence may have been bought, though, as Elizabeth went on to be given a job at Hef's Playboy Club in Chicago. Perhaps she may have been promised a secure job at the trendy hotspot in exchange for keeping quiet about the scandal surrounding her age. Elizabeth Ann Roberts wasn't the only underage playmate, though, and it's reported that at least seven other minors were used in the magazine pages up until 1967, when a change of laws came into effect. But fast forward a few years to 1975, and 10-year-old Brooke Shields has posed nude for a shoot for Sugar and Spice, Playboy's sister magazine. That can't be okay, true. it is true. A 10-year-old. How on earth? Who signs that off? Where are the parents? Where are the family? Who is photographing a 10-year-old in the nude for a fucking magazine? 1975, Jesus Christ. The images of Brooke are highly sexualized with Brooke wearing a full face of heavy makeup. At least one of the images even depicts a full frontal nude picture of the child. And it is unfathomable to think that even in the 70s, when times were different, that a room full of executives thought that this shoot was okay to publish in a magazine. Playboy has never issued an acknowledgement of this shoot, along with so many others depicting young girls in provocative poses, that were totally inappropriate. Going back in time again, and in 1960, the first Playboy Club was opened by Hef in Chicago, and it quickly became the place to be, reportedly being the busiest nightclub in the world at one point. To be a Playboy Club member became a symbol of status, and Playboy Enterprises were making millions of dollars a year from membership fees alone. So they basically had that they look like credit cards. So you could be a Playboy key holder, which was essentially being like a basic level member. You could be a VIP Playboy key holder, or you could be a VIP card holder gold member. And the perks that these VIP card holder gold members got, well, we're going to talk about it more, but it's basically all access to anything, literally anything that they wanted, which is in the most sinister of forms in some cases. So the club, like all things Playboy, did not come without its controversies, and in 1963, Gloria Steinem successfully managed to infiltrate the infamous club and go undetected as an undercover journalist for over a month. Her goal was to uncover the reality of the seemingly glamorous working conditions and to find out whether the iconic role of a Playboy bunny was really all it was cracked up to be. So Hef at this point was a self-proclaimed leader of the sexual revolution taking place in the early 60s, penning articles in his own magazine promoting a healthy attitude towards sex being portrayed in the media, saying, if you don't encourage healthy sexual expression in public, you get unhealthy sexual expression in private. If you attempt to suppress sex in books, magazines, movies, and even everyday conversation, you aren't helping to make sex more private, just more hidden. He believed that he was helping to liberate the girls he employed at the Playboy Club, as opposed to objectifying them, and Gloria Steinem was on a mission to challenge this idea. So Gloria's alias name was Marie, and the initial stage of the recruitment process involved her lying about her age, stating that she was 24, not 28 as she actually was. To which her interviewer responded that 24 was awfully old, and could she also remove her coat to enable them to inspect her body. Marie passed the initial stage and was informed that before she started working on the floor of the club, that various medical examinations would need to be conducted. She reports that she was subjected to both vaginal inspection and a chest x-ray, which I'm sure we can all agree is a little strange considering it was a waitressing job she was interviewing for. Which is just, yeah. yeah. Gloria, as Marie, soon discovered that the working conditions were anything but the glamorous position that Playboy promoted. The wage for one was ridiculously low, meaning the bunnies and bellboys often had to seek out alternative ways to earn extra cash. Stealing from wealthy clients or other staff members was not unheard of. The bunnies were responsible for their own accessories, having to buy their own shoes and stockings, and they even had to pay a weekly fee for the maintenance of their bunny costumes. They were under constant pressure to always appear joyful and playful, and they were threatened with having their wages docked if they strayed from the desired personality projection. The costumes themselves were allegedly another big problem about the job, with them being so tight that it made it hard to breathe. 
Aesthetically pleasing in the eyes of Hugh Hefner and other members who enjoyed the club, the corsets were very restricting, making it difficult for the bunnies to serve drinks in the desired way of the bunny dip. So the bunny dip was a backwards leaning way of serving drinks to the table. So what's that? It's like... Go on, show me. That. I think it's kind of, wow. yeah. See that? I want to see more ass. That? Yeah. It would be hard anyway. It's a big order. What well, would be hard? To serve the drinks. Oh, yeah. And probably a little penis as well. Steinem detailed her experience as a Playboy bunny in a two part article for Show Magazine, aptly named A Bunny's Tale. It wasn't just Steinem's article that sparked scandal about the club. There were also whispers of abuse of power within the walls too, with certain members allegedly having a take what's mine attitude and suggested reports of sex work in order to earn extra cash as well as rape have all been mentioned at one point or another. April 7th, 1974, former Playmate of the Month Paige Young was found dead in her West Hollywood apartment. This was very, very big news of the time and Paige was someone that was a very popular Playmate. So for a long period of time in the build up to this, Paige had been very into her drugs and one individual that had a particular fondness to Paige was Bill Cosby. The two were very well acquainted with one another but it didn't seem like very much of a consensual friendship. With some noting at the time, Paige always seemed to be in a stupor, a daze, and like Bill was controlling her. All that we remember is that their relationship was not healthy. Paige was a young thing who was very much taken advantage of by the men of Hollywood. She was intelligent and talented, and it's a tragedy what happened to her. But the particular scene or alleged scene of Paige Young's suicide that um, shocked the world the most. The walls in her apartment were covered with floor to ceiling photos of Hugh Hefner from news clippings, magazine articles, and her body was found laying across an American flag. Um, she had taken her own life by gunshot to the head. One thing that was widely publicized is that on one of her walls, Hugh Hefner is the devil that had been painted quite largely across the wall. So this was one that drew a lot of controversy and a lot of people have speculated as to why she ended her ended her life. There are some people that even speculate as to whether it was a cover up, but the fact that she had allegedly written Hugh Hefner is the devil on the wall leads many to believe that she had been abused and manipulated by Hefner and Cosby for many, many years. Another major scandal to hit Hef came in 1975 when his devoted assistant Bobby Arnstein was found dead in a hotel room on January 19th. Prior to her death, Bobby, who had been convicted of and served time for drug offences, her arrest once again landed Playboy and Hugh Hefner in hot water, as any time her name appeared in the papers, Hefner was almost always mentioned too. The FBI had apparently been waiting to take Hef down for some time as they didn't agree with his Playboy exploits, and many felt that they wanted to use Bobby as a way to get to her boss. She was sentenced to 15 years in jail, five years more than her male co-conspirators, who had actually been the ones to mastermind the plan to distribute cocaine which is what they were all arrested for. Once again, the female at the center of the Playboy controversy kept quiet and refused to associate Hefner to the drug trafficking plot in any way. Prior to Bobby's suicide of an overdose of sleeping pills, another Playboy employee, 23-year-old Adrian Pollock, died under similar circumstances in 1973. Unlike Bobby's intentional suicide though, Adrian's appeared to be an accidental drug overdose. The drug which ended her life was Quaaludes. So Quaaludes, as we mentioned earlier on, is what the drug that Hef used to refer to as thigh openers, and yeah, they're quite heavily associated with the Playboy mansion as well. So it's alleged that Adrian and Bobby were responsible for supplying the drugs for Hefner's parties, and one of his former girlfriends, Sandra Theodore, is quoted as saying, Hef pretended he wasn't involved in any hard drugs used at the mansion, but that was just a lie. She went on to say, Quaaludes down the line were used for sex. Usually you just took a half, and now if you took two, you pass out. It was such a seduction, and the men knew this, that they could get the girls to do just about anything they wanted if they gave them a Quaalude. After Hefner's death in 2017, multiple allegations of drugging against consent and sexual assaults came to be associated with his name and the Playboy image. The famous Playboy Mansion located in Los Angeles, California, has long been associated with lavish parties and a revolving door of celebrities and beautiful women. However, a much darker side to the party house has been presented in recent years. It is reported that Hef hired a security team with, who were not solely responsible for the protection of the people and the property. It was alleged that other duties included the cover-up of certain allegations made against Hef's VIP and celebrity friends. PJ Maston, a former employee of Playboy for 10 years, has spoken out against Hefner, stating, In the 10 years that I worked for Playboy, I would venture to say that there were probably 40 to 50 young women that were silenced by Playboy because of the abuse and the sexual abuse. Another one of the conspiracies 
conspiracies, and this is one that's really wild, is that underneath the mansion there are a network of tunnels that were used to bring celebrities in and out of the property, but also to bring girls in and out of the property. And that's why shortly after Hefner passed away, they immediately began construction works, mm. filling in the um, tunnels apparently, because obviously the front gate was guarded, had surveillance on it 24 seven. Perfect way around that is an underground tunnel system. Mm. And there are many believe that that was the case. So PG Master went on to say it was a lucrative job. So women were afraid to come forward with a VIP assault. They would lose their job because that's how it worked with Playboy. You open your mouth, you're out of here. And there was a constant turnover of bunnies, constant. Most notably, as we mentioned earlier on, Bill Cosby, who has generated a whole list of sexual misconduct scandals by himself, was found guilty of sexually assault assaulting a 16-year-old teenager at the Playboy Mansion in 1975. Cosby and Heff were good friends, with Cosby often visiting the mansion. It is unknown whether Cosby also took part in the infamous pig nights that Heff liked to put on for his rich and famous friends. So as we mentioned earlier, pig nights would apparently happen every Thursday night at the mansion, and they would entail a group of sex workers to be delivered to the Playboy Mansion at Hefner's request. The sex workers were nicknamed pigs by Hef, and he would set these nights up to enable his VIP friends to engage in whatever sexual activity they so desired. As we mentioned, they would be inspected by the on-site doctor, and if they were clean, they would then be passed over to the eager group of men waiting to take advantage of them. Over the years, the sex stories coming out of the mansion became wilder and wilder, and it's alleged that Hefner filmed everything that went on in the bedroom with or without the other party's consent. Celebrities, athletes, you name it. They'd all had sex and been filmed doing it at the Playboy Mansion. This is kind of a bit like Epstein with his videos. Yeah. Because it's all yeah. like, I mean, if you think, might be the right time to go into it. But yeah, it's, it's essentially his power and he, he, he's able to, you know, blackmail all these people they don't want to be found out they want to be known you know their sexual fantasies what they've been up to if they've been cheating on their wives or whatever sleeping with underage people there's a lot of power that Hef holds here as we mentioned earlier on the kind of similarities between Savile he had a lot of power people didn't want to put his name anywhere because he knew so many secrets or he you know he worked in the kind of way he operated within the uh, society he was known as a kind of a, a, like a, a fun figure a yeah. figure of fun yeah. but that's the thing I was thinking earlier on when I was thinking about this case is a lot of Americans go oh, fucking hell you look at Jimmy Savile he looks like the stereotypical paedophile. It's like, well, if you look at you have an old, dirty old man wearing a dressing gown, we're surrounded by under eight well, young girls. It's like he's obviously a fucking creep as well. It's like yeah. it's like they both on paper. Yeah, that's the thing. If I if this exact case was going on, but you swapped the characters over and Savile mm. was here, I completely understand that. But instead, Savile went for a, a, an apartment in Leeds, an apartment in Scarborough, a caravan, yeah, and a little cottage but in then, Scotland. But then it's like Savile wouldn't sexually associate himself with people or anything like yeah. that, or couples or whatnot. Whereas the whole point of Hefner was it was sexualized he was he was mm. literally flaunting it going around with like six seven girls on his arm yeah. that's all part of the package but people thinking that, oh well it's not weird that an old man it's lives with eight girlfriends yeah, it's and just his persona it's a facade it's literally like we called the Jimmy Savile one it's hidden in plain sight yeah. essentially yeah. these parties that he would throw as well so he'd invite the rich the famous he'd have politicians police officers all sorts of people over and his plan apparently was to with these uh, the surveillance that he had eventually carry some sort of act going on so that he would then always have that against yeah. the person. So he would very much encourage his guests to mingle with the playmates. He'd very much encourage them to uh, partake in whatever drugs were available and apparently quaaludes, cocaine, alcohol was all readily available in large quantities for everyone that was there. But then also his security team are made up of pretty much LAPD <laughs> yeah. police officers that are all on his payroll and it's a completely isolated mansion. Mm. So you're almost in another world in there. Yeah, a lot of people would just be bought off and you're not, yeah, yeah not bought so, in these things. And the more, as we see in so many of the cases like this, the more they get away with, the more they want more. Yeah. And the worse it gets. So we mentioned, obviously, the Linda Lovelace, German Shepherd incident earlier. There are also other accusations that surrounded Hef and bestiality. And it seems as though the older he got and the more established and powerful he became, there seemed to be no limit to his sexual adventures. Orgies, multiple living girlfriends, sex workers and sex acts against animals are all associated with Hugh Hefner. His ex-girlfriend Sondra Theodore recalls a time where she walked in on him attempting to masturbate her dog. Sondra claims that she never left her dog alone with him ever again. We come to the 90s and 2000s, which is where the Playboy brand was probably at its biggest. Stars such as Anna Nicole Smith and Pamela Anderson helped to project the ever-growing glamorous image of Playboy and the Playboy Mansion to the next level. In 2005, The Girls Next Door aired on TV for the first time. The series was built around and focused on Hef's free live-in girlfriends, Holly Madison. I wouldn't say they're free, they're, 
They were trapped there, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, it's I, three. Yeah, sorry. I can't, I can't sorry. say free properly. <laughs> how do I say it properly? Go on. How have you not been taught how to say free? Free. Three. Free. No, you look free. It's th- three. That's better. Wow. That was sick. Three. Three. The series was built around and focused on Hef's two plus one live in girlfriends, Holly Madison. <laughs> the series was built around and focused on Hef's free. Don't stop slowing say, down. People say I can't say free properly. I'm sorry. Free. I think they're right. <laughs> the series was built around and focused on Hef's living girlfriends, Holly Madison, Bridget Marquardt, and Kendra Wilkinson, along with other playmates and special guests. The series quickly gathered a large following and viewers were presented with an unconventional yet luxurious portrayal of how the beautiful girlfriends lived their opulent lives. However, the lifestyle presented on the TV show was apparently very far from the truth. The show did not show the areas of the mansion which were damp and dirty. There were a number of dogs that lived in the mansion and they would use the carpets as their bathrooms, with no one wanting to take responsibility to clean up the mess. Similarly, the infamous Playboy Grotto, a secluded area in the swimming pool, was a scene of many sexual liaisons over the years. However, cleanliness of the pool was clearly not the top of Hess priority, and at one point over 100 people were infected with Legionnaire's disease as a result of the dirty water after one particular party at the mansion. That is rank, and Ben's going to say what Legionnaire's disease is right now. Legionnaire's disease is a lung infection you can get from inhaling droplets of water from things like air conditioning or hot tubs. Or or dirty, stinky, sexy swimming pools. Symptoms of Legionnaire's disease are similar to the symptoms of flu. High temperature, feverishness and chills. Cough, muscle pains, headache and leading on to pneumonia very occasionally. Diarrhea and signs of mental confusion. Some reason I thought it'd be a bit bit rashy, but it's more of an internal thing. That's just your hot tub, I guess. No, my hot tub's great. <laughs> and this shirt is going to be just the only thing I'm going to need. Actually, that would be great for like a hot tub day. So, let me know when you want to come over. Do you next bit? Yeah. On top of the squalid living conditions, the playmates and girlfriends were pitted against each other by Hef, creating a toxic competitiveness amongst the women. They were each expected to have unprotected sex with Hef whenever he so pleased and also have sex with each other in front of him. Another series of witnesses stated that to prevent the potential spread of STDs but also to limit any possible pregnancies because there was so much unprotected sex happening in the mansion, he would encourage anal sex at any opportunity. Yeah, him and the guests and the women, even they didn't want it, it was kind of being forced upon them as well. So yeah, it's very... Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible state of affairs. Holly, Bridget nor Kendra were paid a salary from the Girls Next Door show. Instead, Hef granted them a weekly allowance of $1,000, which although it seems like a fairly substantial amount, there were strict rules surrounding how they spent their money. They were expected to use it solely for personal maintenance, such as maintaining their hair and nails and ensuring that they always stayed in shape. They also used the in-house doctor for any plastic surgery that the girls requested. It was a very toxic atmosphere indeed around physical appearance. They were not allowed to save any of this money to pay off student loans, for example. And if Hef caught wind that they were using their money in such a manner, he would dock or cut off their allowance completely. All three women eventually had enough of their life that they were leading with Hef and each other at the mansion. They all left one by one to pursue different lifestyles and relationships with other people. When Holly Madison declared to Hef that she intended to write a book about her experiences within the world of the Playboy, he offered her $3 million in his will if she kept quiet. So that goes to show obviously that there's a lot of things that he doesn't want people to know about. And also in his will. So you you can't have the money now, but... Yeah. 10 years or so. But then as well, she could just put it up. I guess she doesn't care after all. So once again, demonstrating that he felt powerful or arrogant enough to buy another woman's silence with money, Holly refused the offer and went on to release a best-selling book, Down the Rabbit Hole, anyway, which is a very good title. And years later, prior to his death, the man, once constantly surrounded by beautiful blondes and celebrity friends, spent the majority of his time somewhat alone. Long gone were the hedonistic parties and the orgies of the golden years. The multiple girlfriends were replaced with just one, Crystal Harris, who happened to married on December 31st, 2012, and would remain married to until his death of 2017. Crystal, who was 60 years Hef's junior, has since come out as saying she was manipulated and exploited during her time living with Hef at the mansion. So Hefner would die on September 27th, 2017 at the age of 91 in Los Angeles, California. He died via sepsis from an E. coli infection. So yeah, we're going to get into a bit of aftermath now, but yeah, it's a... As we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, a lot of different people, a lot of different opinions. Some people do still believe, even though he, it was a very dark underbelly to Playboy and Hefner, that he did 
bring a lot of things forward. He did bring on the revolution. He was the face of that. And, you know, the Playboy did have do a lot of good for um, sexual liberation for women. But when you hear about the parties and the kind of how he controlled people and monitored people and the strict rules and there's, you know, there's lots of things out there like the curse of the Playboy Mansion with all the yeah. people, Playboy bunnies at one point in their life, how they're going to live miserable lives or end up in just, you know, really, they weren't looked after, essentially. They were kind of just thrown out to the world and kind of left to their own devices. I think there's going to be a lot more that come out about this as well over the years. Definitely. So we're going to move on to some aftermath now. So after his death, numerous allegations against the man behind the bunny brand have come to light. He literally passed away a month or so before the Me Too movement as well. So I can't help but imagine he would have been Mm. outed then. We've touched upon a few here today, but the list is a big one. And the accusations are outlined in the 2022 documentary series, Secrets of Playboy. I give it mixed reviews. There's a lot of episodes there and it's all kind of, it's not linear in the way it's put together. After the airing of the documentary, Playboy issued a statement via an open letter on their website attempting to distance themselves from their founder. It stated the following. As you know, the Hefner family is no longer associated with Playboy, and today's Playboy is not Hugh Hefner's Playboy. Today, our organisation is run by a workforce that is more than 80% female, and together we are building upon the aspects of our legacy that have made a positive impact including serving as a platform for free expression and a convener of safe conversations on sex, inclusion and freedom. We will continue to confront any parts of our legacy that do not reflect our values today and to build upon the progress we have made as we evolve as a company so that we can drive positive change for you and our communities. I think they also kind of echoed the support and you know, they're standing up for the women who have been mistreated as well. The director was quite pleasantly surprised to get that kind of from Playboy mm-hmm. and they actually included it in, I think, one of the outros of one of the episodes. Like Ben just read through there, like the Hefner family are no longer associated with Playboy, but one of Hefner's plays were always saying that his daughter was going to take over from him at, at, to run Playboy. So when people were kind of saying it's misogynistic and whatnot, he would very much go, well, you know, my daughter's going to be running the show one day, so it got me that misogynistic, mm-hmm. which... Again, you could maybe say Vince McMahon and Stephanie McMahon and some yeah. kind of parallels there. Yeah, like, yeah he, he knew what he was doing. He was very manipulative. And then yeah, he used his family to shield and distract from certain issues. He had a son came to his late father's defense after the documentary aired in January of this year, tweeting, Some may not approve of the life of my dad chose, but my father was not a liar. However, unconventional, he was sincere in his approach and lived honestly. He was generous in nature and cared deeply for people. These salacious stories are a case study of regret becoming revenge. There's lots of pictures of his son with his dad in the kind of similar outfits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like, hmm. And the Playboy Mansion was sold for $100 million, a $100 million reduction on the original listing price of $200 million to billionaire Darren Metro- Metropolis. That sounds like a, a villain. Yeah, maybe he's turned it into, well, it's already quite a layer. A layer. Yeah. yeah. Can we clean the pool, please? <laughs> In 2020, Playboy moved away from the physical magazines into a purely digital format. So yeah, it's all online now. So as as we mentioned, he passed away just a month before the Me Too movement, and that had gained serious momentum at that point. So there was Weinstein, Epstein, R. Kelly, Bill Cosby, Larry Nassar. There was one that I wasn't as familiar with, NXIVM cult leader Keith Ranieri. And that case, I had a little glimpse at it, if I've pronounced that right, N-X-I-V-M. Is that, that could be Roman for something? But yeah, uh, cult leader Keith Ranieri, that looked like a very wild case. So since that particular docuseries came out, even more playmates have come forward to say that they were overdosed, drugged, blackmailed, sexually assaulted, and encouraged to perform sexual acts on visitors to the mansion. Many playmates have either committed suicide or been murdered, with some speculating that these were arranged to look like suicides. Many former playmates and former Playboy staff have since had to hire bodyguards or security since leaving Playboy. Lots of bunnies claim to have experienced Stockholm Syndrome since leaving the the company. Louis the Poodle, so John Dante, who was Hugh Hefner's best friend, allegedly his poodle got so addicted to cocaine that he would smell it from across the room and become highly enthusiastic about getting towards the substance. So apparently if people would enter the room with cocaine under their nose, he would very quickly fly across the room, jump up and try and get to the room. I mean, that could just be a dog that likes kissing. It's true, yeah. Could, yeah. In preparing for this episode, I listened to an entire podcast that believed Hefner was indoctrinated whilst in the army to become an MK Ultra handler in order to pimp women to the rich and famous as well as traffic underage girls. Which on the surface, I mean, it was very kind of anything was a, a tangent that they would go down. But then if you think Epstein Island mm. happened 
and what do we not know about in the world? That's always the the, the, the scary thought, isn't it? Yeah. What's happening behind closed doors? What's happening in upper echelons of society that yeah. we're not aware <laughs> the of? The thing is, like, we didn't know anything about Epstein, like, even existing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Hefner was so an icon, people say, and, you know, he was a kind of a global figure. It's two, it's two, obviously it's two very different ways of, you know, dealing with, like, trying to hide things. Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's it's such a conflicting one, isn't it? Because, yeah, I mean, I didn't know a great deal about Hefner before we researched this or, or did this case, but I wasn't too shocked to think this kind of stuff was going on behind those closed doors, I think. Mm. But um, you would have thought, as you know, like anyone, this kind of thing would have been reported about and been shouted about a lot sooner. I mentioned briefly in the timeline alleged underground tunnels under the Playboy Mansion, and this came about due to tweets from Jenna Jameson, people questioning why did they need uh, tunnels underground. It was allegedly used to transport celebrities in and out of the mansion, as well as women and girls that were being trafficked in and out of the, the mansion. One podcast that I listened to were very, I think it may have even been this one that was a, built around conspiracies, very highly alleged that Larry David was involved in many sexual assaults and that Playboy was in with HBO executives in order to provide support to cover this up. Just like when we covered the Michael Jackson case, there are many people that believe uh, in Hefner's innocence with him being simply a man that cared so much about women that he needed to you know constantly be around them and he did so much for uh, women's rights civil rights equality for all races they simply said that all these people that are now coming out of the woodwork since he passed away are simply chasing a payday or, or five minutes of fame i mean you do sometimes get that in different cases like this so they are claiming that they're trying to stay relevant by making these accusations but then why would you tell stories that are as depraved as this and and relive the trauma for that kind of payday so the main crimes allegedly to have been uh, committed, drug abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, forced sex work, human trafficking, bestiality, rapes, attempted murder, attempted forced suicide, harassment, emotional and financial abuse, as well as blackmail. Here's an interesting one. It's not even in the interesting facts, but here's one for you. Did you know that a breed of rabbit was named after Playboy founder Hugh Hefner? No. Sylvialgus palastris hefneri, also known as the Lower Keys Marsh Rabbit, is an endangered species of marsh rabbit named after Playboy founder Hugh Hefner. In terms of net worth, so not much is or was publicly known about Hefner's net worth. However, as part of his divorce in 2009, he estimated his own net worth to be $43 million, and his net worth at the peak of Playboy was more than $200 million. We mentioned Crystal Hefner, so Hefner's wife at the time of his passing. After his passing, it was revealed that Crystal was excluded from his will, but he did not leave her with nothing. In 2013, Hefner bought her a $5 million West Hollywood mansion, and apparently she also received $7 million in cash shortly after he passed away. He was, in fact, buried next to Hollywood icon Marilyn Monroe, and he's laid to rest in the Westwood Village Memorial Park in Los Angeles. And at the time as well, before any of these allegations came out, one of the most damning obituaries that were written was from New York Times writer Ross Dufat, just three days after Hefner passed away. A lot of people were, were singing Hefner's praises. There wasn't all these allegations that had came out, but this particular article is very, very strongly written. Hugh Hefner, gone to his reward at the age of 91, was a pornographer and chauvinist who got rich on masturbation, consumerism and the exploitation of women aged into a leering grotesque in a captain's hat and died a pack rat in a decaying manse where porn bled during his pathetic orgies. Hef was the grinning pimp of the sexual revolution, with quaaludes for the ladies and Viagra for himself, a father of smut addictions and eating disorders, abortions and divorce and syphilis, a pretentious huckster who published updike stories no one read while doing flesh procurement for celebrities, a revolutionary whose revolution chiefly benefited men much like himself. It's yeah, much fucking all else. It's a much longer, the article, I'd highly recommend it to have a read because it's, um, it points a lot of fingers at Hef um, before anyone else did. Another very big conspiracy is that Hefner was aware that the Me Too movement was in place and that he was actually suicided instead of dying of natural causes, with many believed that he didn't want to face any kind of criminal charges, so he decided to have his life ended intentionally. They believe he could have been the key to unlocking a paedophilia network. 
yeah. of the rich and famous, similar to the Epstein situation. He's literally with all the recordings and stuff like that, isn't it? It's very, very yeah. similar to that. Apparently he'd been dealing with police on a daily basis for the past three weeks up until his death as well. Mm. Curious. I've also got something that's quite interesting. Ben Carter's interesting facts. Interesting facts. Are they? I don't know. Interesting facts. Facts. Did you ever hear about the pubic wars? I can't say I did. Yeah. Well, between the 1960s and the 1970s, Playboy wasn't the only magazine on the rise. It was also competing with Hustler and also competing with Penthouse, which was uh, in the UK. They were trying to edge each other out. Uh, hmm. And basically they were trying to, well, obviously sell more magazines than one another, but they were trying to, they were trying to outdo each other in terms of the content that they provided with Penthouse magazine uh, actually being the first to provide photos of a woman showing her pubic hair or genitals, respectively, apparently. And the pubic wars went on for almost 10 years, which ultimately resulted in the first full frontal photo shoot being published. Which again, back then, 1950s, 60s, 70s, there was nothing else like that. But it was at war. They were called the Pubic Wars, which was actually coined by Hugh Hefner. He went to Pubic War with Hustler and Penthouse. It's a shorter one this week because obviously there's, you know, well, I gave you the rabbit thing. Gave you the rabbit thing. There you go. That's in yeah. The Pubic Wars. The Pubic Wars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, the two magazines moved their content in opposite directions. Playboy positioned itself as less explicit and softcore and stylish, whereas Penthouse ultimately became more raunchy and ended up publishing photos of pornography and women urinating in the mid-90s. So there you Piss go. Piss wars. Piss wars, yeah. Piss wars. Urine wars. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. And now it's time for some lookalikes. What does it look like? That looks like a bit like that. Yeah, it looks a bit like this. I'm going to go first because mine isn't very good and I've only got one and it's a very rogue shout and pff, that's that and I know you're going to have a, a fistful of fistful of people. I'm going for young young Hef but then also sideline his son. Okay. Um, that Hef. See that one I keep there's, he's got that face hasn't he that age Hef, Hef. I don't remember what character this guy played in Gavin and Stacey but it's, oh. Ma it's Matthew Bain Bainton. Oh yeah, he's in he's, Peep Show as well, isn't he? He's Peep Show, and he's also in the R the Wrong Guys. That's very good. That's he was, very good. But he looks like the sun, quite a lot. Wow. But that's literally what I had. I really struggled. Look, Hef <sighs> is one of those people who mine. changes drastically throughout the years. That's done mine, and I was really happy with mine. So okay, for the same era, Hef, I've gone with Bill Nye, the Science Guy. Yes, I, I think I at some point was thinking him as well. Yeah. But I think your guy beats him. I can't claim this next one, but it's bloody good. And it's from totallylookslike.com. Hugh Hefner. <laughs> You've been going on totally looks like that. It came up, actually, when I was trying to get images of him. Hugh Hefner and Admiral Chester Nimitz. Look at this. Yeah. Good, isn't it? I don't know what software they're using on that website, but it's bloody good. <laughs> uh, and then my next one, like I said, middle-aged Hef, and your guy has completely blown this one out of the water, but I really do get Pedro Pascal vibes. Um, he plays Javier Peña in Narcos. He's also Oberyn Martell in Game of Thrones, but I, I think your guy's better. I just think your guy's better. Mm. Something about the eyes, isn't it? I yeah. Why? Well, before I looked into it, do you remember those films, the Ernest films? Yeah, yeah, Ernest. <laughs> yeah, okay. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't look anything like him, but I was like, hey, look, he must look a bit like him, but he definitely doesn't <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. My final one, this is a stretch. I've gotten for old Hef, Les Dennis. Yeah. I'm not going to. No? No. We well, said it's a stretch yourself. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that is the end of Series 6. I want to say a big thank you to Ben and Dan as well for this series. I think, you know, it, we've done some big cases. Yeah, it's been quite the journey. We hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as we have. And, of course, we'll be back again. But we're going to have a bit of a break now, lads. Bit of a break, yeah. A well, bit of a breather. Can we say specifically when we're... I don't think so. But we are going to do a little wrap party with you guys, a little Halloween wrap party on the uh, 31st of October on the Monday. Should we say 8pm? Let's say that. UK time. I know I screwed that before. But we'll be going on to have answer some questions for you guys, hang out with you guys and just have a little like, little chill. 
we still will be producing content during the time our time off over on Patreon, so why not go over there? There's close to 90 episodes over there, minisodes, cases you guys pick and vote for, and it's a lot of fun over there. Yeah, yeah, and they are video and audio episodes, so whether you're a listener or a viewer, we've got we've got something for your eyes. We got you and covered. Your ears. We got you covered. So although we will be taking a break for the next few months, please do give us a follow over on Instagram, which is at Could Murder a Pod. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok, but Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook we post daily over there. We have got some big, big news coming up in the next couple of months. So be sure to follow us at Could Murder a Pod and you'll stay well and truly in the loop of all things ICMAP. And we are still trying to, well, figuring out and sorting out merch and stuff. So don't worry about that. We are still looking at that. Uh, but guys, <laughs> we nearly forgot it. The cult applications. The cult of ICMAP. More. Yeah, we've been inundated with lots and lots of applications and we are going to figure out a better way of getting more involved on, or doing the sum over on Patreon perhaps or doing a special and, you know, running through them a bit more. We've got so many. Stop sending them in. No, it's lovely. No, no, carry on actually. Is yeah, it? it's quite nice. <laughs> okay. Lovely little application here from Callum Parker. And he says, uh, hello to my hopefully future cult leaders. Love that. My application for the cult is to work in the cult's marketing team. As I do that for a company that sells parts of vintage scooters like Vespers and Lambrettas. Oh. That's cool. Yeah. So we, do, we do need marketing. Yeah. That's one thing we definitely need. Some scooters would be good as well, though. Yeah, if you can sort them out. Yeah. Let's just say, get us a Vespa. I couldn't think of anything wrong there, Ben. You can do it. Get us a Vespa. Put us to the test, yeah. Okay, Callum. <laughs> Carrying on with Callum's application, I could transfer these skills into our marketing campaign for more cult members. I'm also a big fan of wrestling, so we could develop oh. some kind of cult wrestling club and watch party. Oh, Callum. Love Bring the- a lot to the table. Yes. Get the table. That's for Callum. That was good. good. That is good. Love the podcast. It really helps me get through my work days. <laughs> That's how comfortable he feels around you, Callum. Callum, welcome. Love the podcast. It really helps me get through my work days listening to gruesome murders and absolutely top tier interesting facts. Brackets. I actually do like the facts. That's for you, Ben. <laughs> Sorry I let you down this week, Callum, but I mean the rabbit. I did bring the rabbits thing. Another one from Emily May Simpson. Hey there, my name's Emily May, long-time listener, cult enthusiast. Uh, I hear you're looking for a resident knitter for your cult. I'd happily join in order to provide some relevant knitwear needed for cult life, such as gloves to keep every member warm during cult bonfires and ruling the night. That's nice. Let's get into glove weather. Cult, now, cult bonfires sounds fun. Also keen baker. Oh. That's great. Love that. Multiple skills. I like it. It's Knitter, baker, fire starter. Be uh, careful about the knitwear on the, uh, the old bumper. Yeah. Another one from Ulster 4545. That's the name. <laughs> <laughs> Scared bed with that one. Hello. Oh, my name is Oliver. I'm 16 years old and I'm applying to be the resident head of security for the cult. This is good. 16, hungry, yeah. security. Yeah. I feel I'd be perfect for this position. I have 10 years experience as a martial artist learning karate. Wow. From six. Wow. wow. Becoming a black belt in four years. Damn, that's ten. Quick. That's quick. That is. Oh. Ten-year-old black belt. I also spent four years learning kickboxing. Wow. Nice. Oliver. I wouldn't mess with him. No. Um, For that reason. I was right to be nervous. <laughs> He's in. At 16, I'm already six foot two and weigh 85 to 90 kilograms. So <laughs> I form an imposing figure. I think even if we didn't want him in, he's coming in. We have yeah, got a choice. Yeah. Yeah. No choice. Though. Welcome. Welcome, Welcome here, please. please. Yeah, have a seat. <laughs> have to. Take our belts. <laughs> and lastly for this week, uh, uh, from Craig. Hello, Craig. Hey, hey Craig. 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 Craigie. <laughs> I would like to join the cult and be the resident lazy person. Everyone can moan about me behind my back. (laughs) Or to my face, it's up to you. But I won't change my ways. I'll put my feet up and watch everyone else work. Thanks. You do need a Craig. I'm going to say no. (laughs) I think we can't just say yes to everyone. And Craig, other than putting your feet on the table, what are you bringing to the table? Yeah. I like your honesty, Craig, though. Yeah, honesty is good. That's good, good, yeah. But if someone said, if a builder said to you, look, I'm coming to to build you a garage, but... I'm shit at it. Craig's coming. <laughs> you get a bring Craig. I mean, have a vote. <laughs> we could we could shuffle him. He said then he goes from being late. Well, he could be a lazy whatever this yeah, is. Exactly. Should we shuffle Craig? No, let's get you a proper you shuffle. Gonna, you want to reject? I want Craig. you guys to. So is that a rejection? I is think first I, rejection. I think we get guys. I mean, you can go down go down in the, the in the history of the podcast as being the first person rejected from from the um, the cult. He sugarcoated it, Craig. You're out. <laughs> 
Craig. Sorry, Craig. But Ben, I mean, we are going to do more of these at a later date, but we're going to, we're going to let Ben have one shuffle. So, um, you know, we have had Ooh, a fair few people. Sounds- a fair few people who have messaged with the shuffle in the title. I'm sure there are like six or seven shuffles, guys, out of the hundreds that have come in. So oh, I no, appreciate it. Yeah, there's, a, there's a good amount of shuffles. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for the shuffle people. Appreciate you all. Uh, right, Ben, you ready for a shuffle? I am. From Kareen M. Hey, Kareen. Hi, Kareen. The first shuffle. Congratulations. Historic. It's yours. Greetings, cult elders. I'm ready for my new life assignment. Ooh. I do personally have a few desirable skills for any cult. I sew. Okay. Ceremonial robes, hello. <laughs> Smart, like it. I cook. I'm pretty green fingered. And I'm great at conflict resolution or escalation, which is good. We need that. Definitely yeah, need that. Yeah. Yeah. Toxic. Thank you. Yeah. But I'm ready uh, to trade in these for my new life. Fingers crossed for an architect or a cult hag slash swamp witch. Swamp witch. Oh, yes. I mean, doing. I Swampy. love swamp witch. I think that's swamp probably. Witch, yeah. I'm excited for you, Kareen. Okay, well, fingers crossed. Is uh, Swamp Witch in the uh... Swamp Witch is not yet in there, but <laughs> I mean, oh, there are quite a few. I'll grab this one for Kareen. Okay, Ooh. the first shuffled roll for Kareen is Inventor. So congratulations, Kareen. You're Congrats. officially the uh, the inventor of the cult. It's a full time <laughs> position. Uh, it's actually six days a week, which is the crazy part of the. But inventions never stop. That's the important thing. So, I mean, she's got the right skills for an inventor. Yeah, it's a combination of things. And I mean, to be honest, like she's going to have to learn on the job, if not. Yeah. But yeah, wel- welcome to the the cult, Kareen. Is the inventor. The inventor. Nice one, Kareen. So welcome. You know, plenty more jobs. Like, well, actually, that's the only inventor job there. But there are some. You know, definitely other things. So let us know, Kareen, if you're happy with that role. But you haven't got a choice. You are the now the inventor. If not, you can invent something to. Make it more of an enjoyable role for yourself. But yes, guys, we'll be away for a short period of time, but we'll be back again. And if you do miss us, you want to head over to Patreon. But we'll be back. We'll be back with... We'll try and do an even bigger series next series. Yeah, but series sh- seven. But there might be some more niche guys in there as well. Mm. But we'll see. But we'll see. It's been an absolute pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for your support. We very much do appreciate it. And all the lovely messages we get, it does mean the world. But like we always say... We say this all the time. Keep doing... <laughs> what are you doing? Well, that's it. Uh, pick, quitting your job for a, well actually no that's very relevant parties. yeah stag party German and, Shepherd yeah oh Jesus unless Don't you are just a German Shepherd then that's fine oh, okay yeah well, well yeah um, we can go to the hay dance with someone hay uh, ride mm-hmm. although hay dance we could invent that um, well it's not you're the inventor um, yeah don't go with someone else's but if you're saying you're going to the hay ride with Hugh then go with Hugh don't go with his best friend because that will, you know, I don't know blame all on that. No, I'm not blaming no, no. Okay. Um, thank you, guys. See, See you later. soon. Toolpit. However, cleansliness of the pool and clean. <laughs> Fucking hell, he's falling apart. Dog have. <laughs> Dog have need. Dog have need too. <laughs> yeah, just leave it at. Masturbate her dog. <laughs>